have our two Bible readings, let me just pray for them. Gracious God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, readers. <clears throat> the first reading is on the back of your beige handout, and it's 1 Chronicles 29, 10 to 18. <clears throat> David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise to you, Lord, the God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatest and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. We are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honour come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight, as were all of our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name comes from your hand and all of it belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent. And now I, I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. Lord, the God of our father, Abraham, Isaac and Israel, keep these desires and thoughts in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. Well, good morning again. The second reading is on the front of your outline. It's Matthew 25, starting at verse 14. <clears throat> Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another, two bags, and to another one, to another, one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold bought, brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not get scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has, has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. 
and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thanks, Naomi and Cass, and I encourage you to keep your Bibles and your outlines handy uh, as we get into our new series, and it's a topical series. Uh, typically, here at Mac, we work our way through Bible books of the Bible to let God speak according to his agenda, but occasionally it's good to hear God speak on a topic or topics, and that's what we're beginning today in a new series, At Home with Jesus. And so let's pray together as we commit uh, not only today, but the whole series to God. God and Father, press this message today to all of our hearts and ignite in us a passion in our souls to trust and to obey you. Help us to fight off distractions that we might clearly hear your word. Help us to be passionate about hearing you speak to us and to have our souls transformed by your message. And so, Lord, may this message accomplish your eternal purposes. Amen. Now, our church, our church vision is to be alive with Christ. And we get that from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. Great verses. Uh, and basically, they tell us that because of his great love, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. And it is by grace that we have been saved. That's a wonderful vision. It is a great thing to be alive with Christ. Now, in this series, At Home with Jesus, we're going to get practical because we need to. We need to be practically thinking through what, what does it mean to be living with Jesus or to be alive with him in every part of our life. And so we're going to hear how to live out our vision in the rooms of our souls in the rooms of our soul. Now, is there anybody here willing to admit uh, that they're a bit of a renovation rescue TV show tragic? Um, a couple of people, good on you, brave ones. Oh, look, they're popular. There can be no doubt about that. There's at least 12 shows like that going at any one time. Um, shows about home reno, shows about style and design, all that sort of stuff. And let's face it, if you have a home, you have been spending time, talents, and treasure maintaining and renovating that house. Today, we're going to be here, or through this series, we're going to be hearing about a so much more important house, if you like, our very eternal souls. And uh, we have this understanding from Jesus. In John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus makes this incredible promise. He says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them. That's great. But then he says, and we will come to them and make our home with them. He is promising that through his Holy Spirit, when we have faith in Jesus Christ, the father and the son come and dwell in us. They make home in us. And so the theme verse for this series as we look at our home or the rooms of our soul is from Proverbs 23, uh, 24, verse 3. And it says this, By wisdom a house is built, and through understanding it is established. Through knowledge its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. It's a great verse. I'd encourage you to memorize it as we go through this series because as those who have the Father and the Son at home, they're doing that reno work in us. And so it's a verse that reminds us that God is going to build his house in us by his design, his wisdom. And then it tells us that through understanding of God's will, our home, our soul will be established for eternity. And finally, this is the bit that I really love, knowing or knowing Christ, as that's our, our, one of our key purposes here, Jesus promises to fill the rooms of your soul with rare and beautiful treasures. Doesn't that sound good? I guess the question is, do we believe it? 
Well, through this series, we're going to see God do that work. And uh, we're going to be looking at a few different rooms in our life. And in the sermon outline and up on the screen, you'll be able to actually see the house there that we're going to kind of go through the various rooms today. We're beginning in the garage as we look at money. Um, we're then going to move to the living room next week as we look at friendship. And then the week after that, we're going to the kitchen to think about share Christ as we, in a sense, share the food of eternal life. And then we're going to go to the main bedroom to look at marriage and singleness. And then finally, the kids' bedroom as we look at parenting and grandparenting. I hope it's going to be a great series as we learn what it is to be at home with Jesus. Today, we're beginning with the garage, like I said, and, and the garage, we're thinking about money. Why? Well, because God has given to his people the tools, the tools that we need to build the kingdom of God. That's such an awesome thing. And it ties in well with our commitment month as we begin it this week. Because, look, it's so important in commitment month that we have, or any month really, that we have God's view about money and understand God's purposes for money. Now, as we think about this, I have a cake. All right. Sorry, you can't have it. Um, what I do want you to do is I want you to think that Everything that you own, all the money that you have, right down to the little cent, and all the material possessions that you have are represented by this cake. Now, the question is, which part's yours and which part's God's? Yeah. Now, do you think, oh, it's okay, I, I, I've got this bit, and hey, I give to God that piece, whatever size that is. Or... Do you think, well, actually, the whole cake is God's? And I want to say, not just do you think that, but how do we live that? Is the whole, if, the, all, if that represents everything that you own, is this yours and God gets a piece or is all of it God's? That's what we're hearing about today. Now, what I'm talking about today is stewardship. I think that's such a wonderful and important thing for us to understand. Stewardship is maximizing all of God's blessings for his glory. It's all that God's blessed us with. Not for us, but for his glory. And we see this in our first reading from 1 Chronicles today. Uh, in the book of the Old Testament called 1 Chronicles, where it talks about uh, the kings of Israel we hear King David, he's a king by this stage, and he's talking about, as we heard in the reading, the incredible wealth of possessions that people have given to build the temple of God for his glory. And it's, it's incredible. But he doesn't get to the point of going, oh, aren't, aren't I awesome? And, and we're so great. If you look with me at verse 14, he says there, but who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? He's not thinking we're great. He's thinking, God, how on earth? Well, then he says, it's because everything comes from you. Everything we have that we've given has come from you. In fact, he says, we have given you only what came from your hand. We've just given it back. That's stewardship. Everything we have is from God. And in fact, in verse 16, David says, it belongs to you, God. It's yours. So the house that you live in, the car that you drive, the money that's in the account, that's not yours or mine. That's such a radical way for us to think, isn't it? But that's stewardship. We've been entrusted with all that we have to maximize God's glory now the bible does speak about money and it shares with us god's wisdom and warnings about money and they're to be taken seriously uh we're gonna have a look at a couple of the passages here and and you'll see in the image uh if we go to the next one thanks tim um we're not talking about just toys here pretend no money is a serious thing 
And so we read here from Ecclesiastes, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Or 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Not money, the love of it. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Or Hebrews 13.5, keep your lives free from the love of money. And be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And finally, from Luke 12, 15, where Jesus himself said, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. There's wisdom and warnings that we need to hear, because there is plenty of lies about money out there in the world. And even the ones that we tell ourselves. Uh, a little while ago, a father took his son to a zoo in China. And the son was just, he'd been talking about seeing the lions. That's what it was all about for him. And so they very quickly, the son's pulling his dad. They get to the lions, dad, and they're, they're kind of looking and they kind of spot one. And but they're like, mm, what's going on there? And then all of a sudden they hear it bark. You see, they were having trouble with the lions, a little bit like uh, Sydney, and their lion had died, couldn't find one, so they put in this dog. <laughs> now we need to realise that there are plenty of lies about money in our world and that we tell ourselves, but God's wisdom and God's warnings are so true and important for us. But that, that is not the only word in the Bible about money. It's not about, you know, feeling guilty. This, series, this sermon, this month of commitment, it's not about feeling guilty or so you've got to give it all away. God is not against money. In fact, there's a wonderful truth that we're hearing today, that we are called to be treasure stewards. Those who follow Christ are called to be treasure stewards. We need to know and remember that the whole cake is God's and the joy that comes from that and the freedom. So let's uh, have a look at the, in Matthew 25, Jesus explaining stewardship for us with this great parable or story. And in the context, Jesus is speaking about living for the kingdom of God, what it is to be a part of it and to live for it. And here he helps us to understand the place of money. And so he talks about how a master is going to go away on a long journey. So he calls in three servants and he entrusts them with bags of gold. Kind of sounds exciting. Uh, the first one gets five, second one gets two, last one, the third one gets one bag of gold. The master goes away, but we read about how the first two, they we're told at once, they are chomping at the bit. They cannot wait to get into business to grow the master's benefit or profit, if you like. Now, they are not seeking their best. This money's been entrusted to them. They're actually not going to get any benefit from it. No, the money doesn't belong to them. The profits won't go to them. They're not getting a share or a portion of it. No, it's for the master's benefit. And they're into it. However, the third servant digs a hole, buries it. Big difference. Well, eventually the master returns. And so the first servants, they're excited. Do you get the sense of their joy as they bring forward double the amount that they've been able to make for the master? And he lavishes praise on them. That wonderful line, well done, good and faithful servants. And those of us who follow Christ, who are seeking to be faithful stewards, don't we love to hear that word from Jesus? Well done, good and faithful servant. I think those servants were over the moon to hear that. And not only that, but they, because they'd been faithful with a little, they were going to get more. And then the best part, I love this line at the end there in the story. Jesus says, the master says, come, come and share in your master's happiness. 
you know, they knew that the money was not theirs and they weren't going to get necessarily the direct profits. But here, there's actually this incredible privilege and invitation. Come and share in it. It can be yours in a sense as you, as I share this with you and my joy. Well, the third servant, he is condemned. It's because when he got his bag of gold, he immediately went, well, there's no benefit to me. So why should the master get a benefit? He was so concerned in him missing out. I put my time, my talents, my treasure into that. No, 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 I'll just play it safe. You know, I can't get into trouble if I don't lose his money. So he buried it. And we too can be like the third servant. When we think or, or we kind of think like him and say, well, hang on, this is my money. I worked for it. I earned it. It's my money in the bank. Oh, that's my investment. Or this is what I worked my whole life for to retire on this. And so we bury it. We may not say it out loud. But in our actions, what we do with our money, we are burying it. Burying, uh, burying it. Now, that, that doesn't mean not giving necessarily any at all. It just means giving enough to get out of trouble. Uh, tick the box so that the master doesn't get unhappy. See how the, the servant had such a twisted view of his master. He's hard and he reached where he doesn't say, well, no. All of it's God's. See, Jesus is showing us that faithful stewardship leads to sharing in God's joy, not missing out. And as stewards, we have been entrusted with all that we have to seek God's glory. That's an incredible privilege. God provides what we have, whether it be a little or a lot, so that we can partner with him in building the kingdom of God. That's extraordinary. It's one of the reasons why I love the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, or over 5,000 really. You might know the story. There's a huge crowd there. They've come to listen to Jesus. It's been going for a while, and so Jesus gets concerned. Hey, they've got nothing to eat. Puts it on the disciples. They're going, oh, we don't know what to do. They're freaking out. So they go amongst the crowd. And they find a little boy. And what has he got? Five loaves, two fish. There's 5,000 men plus their wives, plus their families. There's possibly nearly 12 and a half to 15,000 people here. Five loaves, two fish? Really? Now, at the point of the story, the main point is that Jesus can provide what not only our stomachs need, but our souls for eternity. But I love this part with this boy. Because God made sure that morning that his mum packed for him five loaves, two fish. Why? So that he could be a part of one of the most extraordinary miracles. All these people fed plus 12 baskets of leftovers. You've got to love leftovers. And it's all because of this tiny, little, seemingly pathetic amount. But look what Jesus did with it. But you can bet that boy, when he went home, he's telling his mom and his dad and his family and his friends what he got to be a part of, the excitement and the joy. And not just that day, but every day for the rest of his life. Because he had the privilege of being a part of what Jesus was doing. We too, as stewards, get to partner with God in what he is doing for eternity. And that. That is a great joy. That's about sharing in our master's happiness. And that's why we want to have as stewards, God as the treasure of our hearts. We want to have God as the treasure of our hearts. When it comes to money, this room of our soul, we want to have God as the treasure of our hearts. And we read about this in Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Uh, it's going to be up on the screen. Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. It's really simple logic, isn't it? Earthly things don't last. Heavenly things last for eternity. Jesus says, invest in eternity. But then he goes on to say, 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What we value, what we feel is our treasure, that's what we're going to love. That's what we're going to live for. So Jesus is asking us, well, are we investing in heaven or earth? Where is our heart? Where is our treasure? See, commitment month. It's an important and really helpful time in our year as stewards to do a heart checkup. Always good to have your heart checked, all right, to be healthy. That's all we're doing for a month. We're taking that time to make sure God is the treasure of our heart. And that's a great thing to do. That's a worthwhile thing to do. And to prayerfully consider how we can be maximizing all that God has blessed us with for his glory, not ours. So we give thanks to all that is provided. And we pray, God, lead and guide me as we think, I think about how it is that I can maximize every bit that you've given me for your glory. And know the joy of partnering with him. And so to have God as the treasure of our hearts, I want to encourage us to think about that in two ways today. The first one is we have God as the treasure of our hearts when we give regularly as stewards. That's a part of making sure that we're putting God first and we're partnering in what he's doing. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul there is talking to the Corinthians about a giving or a donation that they, a collection rather, that they were going to give to the Christians in Jerusalem who are being persecuted and are doing it tough. That's what he's been talking about. And so he gives this really helpful principle that I think is great for all stewards. He says in verse two, on the first day of the week, each of you should give a, a, should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up. So when I come, no collections will have to be made. What he's saying is put God first. At the beginning of the week, or as you think about your finances, give God to God first rather than give him the leftovers. Throughout the whole Old Testament, as I talk about the sacrifices, it says again and again, don't give God your worst animal, the one with the defects, the lame duck. Give him your best. Give him the first fruits and the first crop, not the last leftovers. That's what we are to be doing as stewards. And the commitment card is a way to help us do that, to prayerfully through this month, think about what it is that God has enabled us in keeping with our income. There's wisdom and faith here to set aside and commit to giving in 2023. It's a great thing to do. And one of the fantastic things about it is when we do that together, because we partner together as stewards in order to pursue our vision of not only us being more alive with Christ, but seeing others who are currently dead made alive with Christ. That's worth investing in. And it's so great when we do this together. That's the first way. The second way to have God as the treasure of our hearts is to make sure that we're giving with joy, not out of guilt. Today's sermon, this series, this month, it's not about guilt. It's about giving with joy. Paul also talks about this in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7. He says, each of you should give what you've decided in your hearts to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. See, we're not meant to be like the third servant. Oh, okay. Got to do something with it. I'll give him this, this little portion, tick the box. No, let her take the time, take the month to pray and then to plan. And to ask God to, to be at work in our hearts so that we do it with the right motives, that we do it with joy, with a cheerfulness. Because it doesn't always happen naturally. We want to ask God to give us that. And to be excited and passionate about partnering with him. <clears throat> So that we don't give reluctantly, but we actually long, long, like in that story Jesus told, to hear the master's praise, well done, good and faithful servant. And that's what Paul says, God loves a cheerful giver or a joyful steward. 
we're going to be hearing about living at home with Jesus. And that includes our money. So think about the garage today. We are reminded that God has entrusted each one of us as his people with the tools we need to be a part of building the kingdom of God. And isn't that the greatest privilege and something that we can partner in together? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your wisdom from your word about how we can partner together and partner with you to build your kingdom. Give us understanding of your will so that we are all established for eternity. Fill the room of our soul with rare and beautiful treasures as we seek to be faithful stewards and share in your happiness by investing in heavenly treasures. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to use the QR code. Love to hear from you if you've got any questions or comments about the sermon. Well, good morning. Uh, my name's Chris. Um, I've been lucky to have the privilege of looking after the band and the music for quite a few years now. And in case you haven't heard, our very talented singer and musician, Jess, is moving away to Canberra a bit later this month. I'll hand out the tissues later. Okay. Um, but I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you. Uh, thank you for your time, your talent your dedication uh, to the music ministry here at Mac. Uh, we've all very much uh, been the grateful recipients of that. Um, I'd like to, uh, also, I think you've been in the band what, 10 plus years, maybe. So you've got some long service leave up. That's good. Um, but you've been awesome on the violin, the piano, vocals, leading. Um, it's just been really good having you in the band. Um, so to show you our appreciation, I've got this uh, small little blue square. Um, as a gift um, and so we just want to say thank you and all the best in the future and if you can sing we're looking for some replacements <laughs> no. um, and now it's time to sing our last song um, in Christ alone so please stand and belt it out
定性。As we come to uh, our conclusion, thank you for being here this morning and making our service um, wonderful to be experienced. And I'd like to thank all those. Well, the musos, yeah, yes. I got one. I know one bloke who won't be replacing you. Otherwise, they'd be throwing bricks at me. So, <laughs> um, but thank you all from Tim up there and the musos and all that breed and so on. And, and Rob, thank you for your your word there's a lot of challenge in that what you said and i much appreciate it um we'll have all got th different things out of it <clears throat> but a couple of the things that i got was to be treasure stewards and i love that phrase well done and faithful servant wouldn't that be a good one to have chiseled on your tombstone for the rest of eternity to know that you are so grateful to what god has done for you and then to come and come and share in God's joy, that that's the one that really got me too. So it's not a, it's not a labour; it's a pleasurable work to be involved in. Could you open up your or the back? Sorry, don't open it up at the back. Our vision prayer. Let's say this together. Together, Heavenly Father. Great is your love and rich is your mercy. You have made us alive with Christ when we were dead in sin. Help us to be passionately alive with you in our homes and the highlands, in all our gatherings and about taking the gospel to the world. So the immeasurable riches of your grace to us in Christ are made known. And we'll say the words of the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Do stay for a cuppa and um, have a chat then and introduce yourselves to the new people that are here. Thank you.